Bienvenue to tous. Welcome to Reporters Plus here on France 24. I'm Mark Owen. Catholic priests have never been under so much scrutiny and so much pressure. The church buckling under the revelation of over 200,000 children sexually abused by priests here in France over the past seven decades. But our report by Alexandra Renard, George Yazbek and Tom Waterhouse is taking a different angle. They've met priests who've broken with the vow of celibacy to have consenting sexual relationships, just like ordinary people. Progressive thinkers within the church see this more and more as the way ahead. Marc is a parish priest who's based in the Paris region. This Sunday, like every other Sunday for the past 17 years, he'll be holding mass. But beforehand, there's time for a quick break with Ingrid, the parishioner who he fell in love with three years ago. She's a mum to five children and she's always played an active role in church life. It was at the baptism of her last child that the two first met. When I think about the other people in the parish, some of them didn't even dare touch him. He was like some sacred being for them. Before becoming a priest, he was born a man. When he came out of his mom's womb, he was Mark. He was a boy. He was Mark before he was a priest. I suffered for a long time from being considered different from the rest. Our relationship has been fairly straightforward. Ingrid's son Lancelot saw Marc drop by now and again. He then noticed that the visits to the family home were becoming more regular. The priest finally moved in two years ago. I had this image of what a priest should be, with the vows of chastity and so on. This is not about breaking the law, but it's unusual nonetheless. There's something strange about it. In the beginning, I took it badly, really badly, in fact. Now I think of him like a dad. Marc comes from a religious family. At the Sciences Po Political School, he had some girlfriends. He entered the seminary when he was 22 years old and quickly realized that women were now a danger. Be careful, be vigilant, keep your distance, don't be reckless. Those were the terms that were used. And then I noticed that there were some youngsters who couldn't fully accept their sexual orientation and their homosexuality, and who took some kind of refuge in the church. It's something that I spotted at the seminary, and it started to shout out to me. But I was still true to myself and what I wanted, and that was to give myself totally. So I put all that to one side and pushed ahead with my vocation. Following his ordination, he was more or less happy for two years. Then came 15 years of non-stop work to try and forget the sense of disillusionment and the feeling that he was trapped. Unfortunately, today the Catholic Church is building a relationship that priests just have to accept. I think that the Church has been consciously, and for several centuries, acting as a control mechanism. There's this idea that they have to keep the flock in check. I wanted to be a full and responsible being, and everything that that entails. It also includes one's capacity to love and be loved, and not just to be an instrument. When he was 41 years old, he found love, even though it was forbidden. It didn't feel like we were breaking any rules. There was just one moment when we kissed each other for the first time. It was me that kissed him. He was dressed totally in black back then, with a dog collar, 
like a real clergyman. I felt guilty, not because he was a priest, but more because we were putting our friendship at risk. I said to myself that we were ruining something special, but it had nothing to do with the fact that he was a priest. So yes, we have a priest at home, and now, for example, he's off to celebrate Mass. I think it's a shame that they don't allow them to do that and have a family life, because it's what he does anyway, and it doesn't have any impact on our family life. Nor on the life of the church. <laughs> After keeping their secret for two years, the couple thought it was high time to bring their love out into the open. In June 2020, Mark broke the news to his superior. His bishop decided to move Mark to a different parish to get him far away from Ingrid. He also advised him to consider chastity for a year. The more that sexuality remains a taboo or something that's forbidden, the more indiscretions there will be. We've seen a fair few church scandals lately. I'm not just talking about the sexual abuse of minors, but the sexual abuse of non-consenting adults, too. Some might say, yes, but that exists everywhere in all areas of life. That's true, but in the church, there's this notion of the banned and the taboo. The less one can experience one's sexuality peacefully and healthily, the higher the risk of this kind of sexual misconduct. According to Marc, this sexual violence has been covered up by a collective decision in the Catholic Church. This culture of secrecy is deep-rooted in the Church. It protects against any evil acts, and everything is placed in the same basket. That means, for example, that at the moment I am forced to keep a secret and keep up this clandestinity to hold on to my job. They have put me in the same category as a priest who has sexually abused youngsters. Everything has been mixed all together. Hello, how are you? It's the 9th of May 2021. Marc has three new communions in his diary. What's hard is not being able to share it with those around me to not be able to talk about my life with my parishioners. My life isn't detrimental to the gospel or to mankind. What's difficult is not being truthful. And in your heart now, how do you feel? Very good. This is when we meet with the Lord. It's very beautiful. What you are about to undertake today is a step forward. You are coming closer together. Entering into communion is about being united with each other, united in the same love. Sanctify these gifts and spread your spirit over them. Mark will be meeting with his bishop in 24 hours' time to decide on a way forward. Clandestinity was almost put forward as a solution. It's easier that way for the church and for the authorities. We can continue without having to reveal anything. My choice and the choice I've made with Ingrid has always been to be truthful. We also wanted to show the church that we are doing no harm and that there's nothing to hide. Unlike monks, priests don't actually take vows of chastity. They just can't get married. In the Catholic Church, sex is only allowed between a married couple, and celibacy therefore means total sexual abstinence. Lots of priests are, though, sexually active and have a love life. But these are forbidden double lives played out in secret, as studies have shown. Sexuality in the church is a taboo, and so it's difficult to look into. Some talk about 50% of priests who are active and 50% who are not. Either way, it's clear that some are sexually active. All the more so because the pressure to have a perfect priesthood weighs even heavier when priests are less numerous. There are roughly 8,000 priests working in dioceses today. The number of priests hasn't stopped falling for decades. 
At the end of June, there were around 120 men who entered the priesthood, either in a diocese or in the framework of a religious community. But for these 120 newcomers, we've seen between 300 and 400 priests die. I think that for a lot of priests, the difficulties that stem from celibacy fade away through a kind of agreement that they make with themselves. They might have a partner or a one-night stand now and again, and as long as it's not seen, it's okay. And in any case, the bishops need priests, so they turn a blind eye. Outside the Catholic Church, people think priests can have an overactive or even deviant sexuality. On the inside, believers have a real problem imagining that priests can even have a sexuality. Since the 1960s, the sexual revolution has radically transformed human relationships. Non-procreational sex is now recognized, equality between the sexes is being reasserted, and contraception and abortion have been legalized. But nothing, or nearly nothing, has changed in the Catholic Church. The San Sulpice Seminary in the town of Isili Munino was founded back in 1642. It's one of the main training centers for priests in France. There are currently 36 candidates training for the priesthood from dioceses across France and overseas. Listen carefully to what Kierkegaard says. It is better to have a man who is scandalized by Christianity and who is then placed in a direct and profound relationship with himself than some conjecture that he understands. The trainees are supervised by priests and a superior during their six years of training. They spend two years studying philosophy and two years studying theology. As well as their prayers, each week they have 15 hours of lessons and 20 hours of personal development. Etienne is in his final year. He's already a deacon and is sent to a parish four days a week. I led a completely normal life until I was 20. I had no desire at all to become a priest. So I have a totally normal life. Trainee priests and priests in general are not aliens. I used to go to Mass every Sunday. I wanted to start a family and have a job. And when I came to Sergi to do my engineering studies, I started going to the students' Catholic chaplaincy. One weekend, and in an inexplicable way, I was really touched by the grace and the love of God. And so through human reasoning, I had this desire to become a priest. This was a revelation which heralded the start of his commitment to celibacy. It was natural. It was just obvious that I couldn't compartmentalize my heart or cut it in two. I couldn't love a girl on one hand and dedicate myself totally to God and to the people of God on the other. Etienne has been preparing for nine years to abandon his sexuality, his love life, and any plans for fatherhood that he might have wanted. The seminary is a real school of freedom. We are free to talk about whatever we want with our spiritual teacher, so much so that the spiritual teacher is sworn to secrecy and can't tell anyone what we have discussed. This is an exact replica of the Royal Chapel at Versailles and is a listed building. Prayers here take up a good chunk of the trainees' time and are a key part of their daily routine. Here at the seminary, we clearly teach the candidates about consecrated celibacy. We discuss the whole issue with them, and one-to-one -one as well, to make sure that they're making a considered decision, and that it's not just a sudden impulse. It's not because we have had a strong spiritual experience that we are necessarily going to serve our Lord as a devoted celibate. Since the 2000s, trainee priests have had to take part in classes dedicated to addictions like video games, alcohol or pornography. 
De fait, on a des interventions de, de, de psychologues. Psychologists come and see us, and we also have sexologists who help us when it comes to the issue of sexuality, to help us better understand how sexuality works, what the meaning of it is, and that it is beautiful, that it is given by the Lord to men and women. So the idea of celibacy is built from all these different elements. And since 2016, the Catholic Church in France has recommended sessions to prevent paedophilia in all seminaries nationwide. It's down to the teachers to spot any signs of weakness and to rule out any at-risk candidates in these exclusively male communities. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let us live according to your justice and give thanks for all the good things done by Jesus Christ our Lord. In a few weeks' time, Etienne will leave this training centre. He will be ordained as a priest in the Diocese of Pontoise to the northwest of Paris. Personally, I'm totally in favour of celibacy, because in a society which so often refuses the question of God, I think that it's a strong stance for clergymen and women to take to give up everything for God. It makes you want to give everything as well and to let go of everything for God. But right up until his ordination, Etienne will still be able to back out. The question that I have to ask myself is, how can I keep my word and stick to this consecration that I've made for my whole life? As long as I know that there is this living relationship between God and myself through prayer, I know that any kind of doubt can be easily removed. As long as I remember this relationship between myself and Jesus Christ, a relationship that's alive. From time to time, questions can of course crop up. One might have feelings of love, but that's also when the choices we have made are reaffirmed. Despite a growing number of future priests coming from overseas, the number of those willing to live the celibate life in the name of God from France are dwindling. Raoul was born and raised in Cameroon. He arrived in the Paris region when he was 20 and started his priest training seven years later. I was baptized when I was 14. It was something I personally asked for. I used to live like everybody else. I used to have girlfriends. I didn't have tons of them, but I had some before. If I want to be a priest and get married, though, I should have perhaps knocked on the door of some other church. In the year before I joined the seminary, we used to go on Jesuit retreats. It was 30 days of silence and prayers, and every day we would meet with the spiritual leader. And one evening I was in my room and I was sat on my bed, and I was crying tears of great joy because I had realized that God had always been there in my life and that he loved me and would always love me. He will soon become a priest in the Ile-de-France region. His views on the sacralization of celibate priests are crystal clear. We heard about some scandals involving celibate priests. It's not because I have chosen to be celibate that I am better. They are men like everyone else. They shouldn't be sanctified. Raoul says he has never come across homosexuality, neither in the seminary nor in the wider church. The body that looks after the training of priests has clearly said that any person with homosexual tendencies cannot be allowed to train. The church does not condemn gay people. Pope Francis has said, who am I to condemn them? But the church condemns the practice. I don't think that the church is a refuge for gay people. What we are trying to do is make sure our candidates are peaceful and balanced people who are totally comfortable with the priesthood. Within these walls, where the future men of the church are trained, the official line can't differ from the one coming from the Vatican. 
homosexuality is a sin in the eyes of the Catholic Church. But on the Holy See's website, this instruction has been posted. Different, however, would be the case of homosexual tendencies as the expression of a transitory problem, for example, that of an adolescence not yet superseded. Nevertheless, such tendencies must be clearly overcome at least three years before ordination. Nowadays, the recruitment pool is very small. We're talking about men who have grown up with Catholicism from a very young age, who've been to private school, who were altar boys, who were scouts, people who come from very religious backgrounds, families who have now really become become minorities. In these very conservative families, a homosexual life lived out in the open, in society, and potentially in the framework of a relationship, is not an option for a man who feels that he can't have a heterosexual marriage, and so he turns towards the priesthood. To love the church or to love somebody, the majority of sexually active priests have chosen to not choose. They carry out their religious duties and keep their love lives firmly behind closed doors. Their relationships are sometimes fleeting, but often long-lasting, and many of these priests are homosexuals. I've never told my family about my homosexuality. I waited for 30 years before I finally spoke about my sexual identity. The first person I told was my bishop, who was very understanding. But he did suggest that I go and spend a year in a monastery, and he recommended that I go and see a certain priest who helped gay people. My only wish was to be able to combine my faith with my own identity. The spiritual guide he had since his seminary was, however, not so understanding. When I told him what was going on, he just shut down completely. I really felt a kind of violence in his attitude. When he was growing up, it took Didier a long time to realize that he was different. What he was certain of, though, was the fact that he wanted to become a priest. It was a decision I made while I was still living at home. I saw the violence that my father subjected my mother to. This injustice was kind of a calling for me to strive for justice by following Christ. His other reason for wanting to become a priest was because homosexuality was still illegal at the time. It was at the same time that I was going through all of this. I said to myself that one day soon, God will give me the strength to correct my ways if I had sinned. I thought that through being ordained, I could get rid of anything that was bad in me. Joining the priesthood seemed to be the only way forward to find my right place. When he was 20, he decided to join a seminary. I felt closer to some more than others, and I had the feeling that we had the same sexual identity. But it was all a taboo, and each of us had to deal with it internally. Back then, the seminary was also a place to meet and flirt with men, and after having these kinds of conversations, we felt better. When I became aroused, or when I was simply masturbating and imagining this or that scenario, I really felt like it was a failure in regards to the new life I was preparing to commit to. He's now a priest who's in love, but every day he still feels that he's torn between his two worlds. In my work today, I find myself reaching out to those who are excluded. I find that I'm closer to them, and that's because I used to feel excluded. If Didier and Samy are eager to tell their story, it's in the hope that the church and society might change. It doesn't bother me whether he is a priest or not. It's more about his life. If he has chosen to do that, I accept him for what he is.
Je suis pas que prêtre. I'm not just a priest. Being a priest is just a job. Above all, I am a man. I have my life in a couple. I have my friends. I live like everyone else does. When I have to preside over a wedding, I know what being in love means. I know the difficulties that are involved. I'm aware of the advantages. And I know the effort you have to put in to make it last. I come from a Muslim community where it is forbidden. It is seen as a sin as well. Some of my friends know what's going on. My family, of course, doesn't know. Maybe that will change. We haven't chosen to be gay. It's just love. I think that we can say without any doubt that 50% of priests are gay, whether they're sexually active or not. The official line is that normally homosexual candidates can't become priests. That creates a double taboo for those who are possibly homosexual and who are sexually active as well. Paradoxically, the more the Church develops this somewhat aggressive homophobic position that we've seen emerge since the 1980s, in response to the fact that societies are increasingly accepting homosexuality, the more the Church is attracting gay people but who have a completely internalized homophobia. If a large number of priests prefer to lead a double life, others have chosen to hang up their cassock for good to be with their loved one. It's a rare and difficult step, but one that Patrice took 18 years ago. He's one of eight children from a very religious family. His parents dreamed that one of their kids would become a priest. Just after secondary school, he began his training and was ordained when he was 27. This is prostration, when you lie on the floor and pray to give the future priest strength for his vocation. It's about selflessness, about giving yourself and about humility. This is the imposition of the hands by the bishop. It's the transfer of the gift of God in the church. For me, this is a symbolic gesture which appoints the person as being an important actor in a church. It's more than some magic power being bestowed. This, though, was what my parents thought. When I became a priest, my parents, and my mother in particular, thought I almost had the hands of God. He remained a priest until the age of 38, when he fell in love with the future mother of his children. He dropped everything and in secret to be with her, his parish, his home, and his flock. On the 23rd of May, 2003, we loaded up a little truck that we had hired. We filled it with my furniture, my belongings, my computer, my books. And at 2 a.m., we drove to the post office to post the 200 letters I had written explaining my decision. A month earlier, he had broke the news to his bishop. At the time, Patrice was in charge of 25 villages in the Vercors Mountains. I really enjoyed working as a spiritual guide, be it for births, marriages or deaths. But little by little, the loneliness grew with every baptism and wedding he presided over. In the end, I became something of an outsider to all of that. I was the onlooker. On several occasions, I reminded myself that this wasn't for me, that I had chosen something else. I had decided to be a priest. And so in some way, I was excluded. There were periods of great solitude that I tried to get through as bravely as I could. And then there were other times when I was really busy, and that's what helped me get through it. There was always something that I had to do, and I got really involved in my work because I still believed in it. But I missed the interpersonal side of things, the affection, the physical, having a partner day to day, the tenderness, the exchanges that one has with a person. I suppose it's what we call love at the end of the day. Even if we say that God is love and that we give our lives for love, it wasn't enough for me. 
There was a side to love that I was never able to reach, and that was the expression of myself, of my whole being, both emotional and sexual, that didn't exist. And I suffered because of that. Patrice married the woman that he left the church for. They had three daughters and then got divorced. For nine years now, he's been living with his new partner, Sylvie. He regrets nothing about his choice, except perhaps the response that he got from some of his loved ones. The price I paid was perhaps the lack of understanding I had from certain members of my family. For them, my decision was not just foolish, it was also an act of treason. Whereas for me, it was fulfilling something for me and for my life. We were totally at odds over the issue. And so I just had to get some distance from some of my closest family to prevent any suffering. Today, Patrice runs a health and social help center. In the Catholic tradition, you're a priest for life. So even if you quit your ministry, you're still a priest. I therefore felt that those around me saw me as someone going out of a priest, and that I was responsible. There was this feeling of shame. It went against the values that I had learnt, that my parents and my family had passed on to me. I'm now trying to find myself, intellectually and philosophically. I don't even know what it means if God exists and if it even matters. I think the best thing we can do in His name is to live together as brothers. Amen. Martine mans the phones voluntarily for Plein Jour, a support network for priests, nuns and bishops who are leading double lives. But often it's the partners of clergymen who get in touch. Today, 20-year-old Victoire from Madagascar has called. Hello? Yes, hello, Victoire. Hi. Is the situation with your partner still the same? Most of the time we meet once or twice a week. We go to public places. He tells me that I still have a choice, that I can change my life, and that he's not forcing me to do anything. Victoire knows that she's not the first woman that this priest has met. To my knowledge, I am the second or even the third. I've tried to end things, but I've never managed to. He never hurts me. When it comes to society or the family, it's still a bit difficult, but between us, things are great. <laughs> we learn that Victoire has terminated several pregnancies which her priest has known about and paid for. Each time she's had the abortion alone and far away from home. I knew that it would be very difficult, and it's a decision I've made with a heavy heart. Martine is the partner of a priest herself. They've lived together for 20 years. She's chosen to remain anonymous so that he won't be forced to leave the church. We met outside of church at the home of some mutual friends. I had no idea that he was a priest. We met over the course of a weekend. When I found out he was a priest, I'd already fallen for him and it was hard for me to turn back. Like most priests who lead a double life, he doesn't want to leave his ministry. I didn't think for one second that it was going to be so hard, with so much deprivation, frustration and pain. We can't share a family meal together. We can go on holiday, but we have to be discreet. We have to lie. There have been great times, but only when we're alone and when he has nothing in his diary. I'm really the third wheel. They split up for five years, but finally got back together again. Other people see me as the eternal spinster with nobody in her life. He's met my children once or twice. He introduced himself as being a friend of mine. My kids don't suspect anything. It's not easy. I would like to share this with them. On his side, none of his loved ones know. It really makes me feel like I'm just his mistress. 
According to the Plein Jour Association, there are hundreds of women in France who are in the same boat as Martine, clandestine lovers of priests committing sin in the eyes of the church. I'm angry because I've found someone that I really match with. Nowadays we have same-sex marriage and divorce, and society has changed. What does it matter if clergymen and women have partners in their lives? The church has strong opinions on all of this, but it doesn't care about the suffering we have to go through. It's too easy. The bishops and the church had loads of power, and we just want to live like everyone else does. The Archbishop of Bourges is in charge of the training and lives of priests at France's Bishops' Conference, a body which brings together all the cardinals and bishops from across the country. I think that if it leads them to have a double life, it's essential that they aren't priests and that they abandon the priesthood. I think that baptized people don't want to have a priest who's a hypocrite, and that it's best that they don't carry out such a mission for the people of God. So I'm shocked because it's just not fair on these women and it's not good. And when it comes to their communities, I really don't know how they can look at their parishioners in the eye. En les regardant dans les yeux, quoi. Christiane is an only child. She grew up in a troubled household. Her very religious Catholic mother enjoyed going out, while her agnostic father preferred to stay in and he was often violent. I said to myself that I would like to start my own family and that it would be a happy family without any of the problems that I experienced during my own childhood. She was a 22-year-old medical student when she met a man who wanted to settle down with her and have children. She wasn't sure and went to confide in her priest. He, however, confessed that he loved her and so began 45 years of clandestine happiness. The couple hoped to have a normal life once he retired from the church at the age of 75. But he died that very year and they never had any children. Very early on, he said to me, if I wasn't a priest, we would have had children. He suffered a lot because of that. But we couldn't have children with the pressure of having to keep everything hidden. Neither of us would have wanted that. All children of priests suffer. Leah is the daughter of a priest. She's 43 now and tries each day to live an anonymous life. It's her way of protecting herself. I come to a church like this one for peace and quiet. I like to look at the windows, but just for their aesthetic value. I don't care at all about religion and I have no faith. For me, this is a bit like dad's place of work. So I come because he's here, he lives here, even if religion ended up causing him so much anguish. We suffered a lot because of all the intimidation and the horrors we endured. I shudder thinking about it. She lives in a little house on the Atlantic coast. It's a refuge where she keeps all the souvenirs of her father, an orphan taken in by the Jesuits. I keep most of Dad's things in this suitcase. There's not a great deal of his stuff left. Here are some photos of him wearing his Jesuit cassock. He must have been 25 or 30 years old when these were taken. I think this was in the 1960s. These are the only two photos I have left of him from that time. He never wanted to talk about the period when he was a priest because it was all too painful for him. The Jesuits have a reputation of being the intellectuals of the church because their training lasts for 15 years. No woman is allowed to join their order. My parents met at a school in the Lyon region. My father, who was a Jesuit, was teaching philosophy when he met my mom, who was a stand-in literature teacher. They fell in love in the way that it can just happen, anywhere and at any time. My dad decided to leave the church to get married. 
He therefore complied with the church authorities. Two years later, Leo was born, followed by a son. My father came from a big family. He had four brothers. All these people are my cousins. I have their photographs, but I don't know who they are. They rejected my father when he left the priesthood and got married and had children. In their eyes, we were the children of Satan. We should never have been born. My mom's parents were furious. They were simple immigrant folk from Spain, and for them religion was sacred. When they found out that my mom had fallen in love with a clergyman, it was a big drama. They kicked her out. Rejected by both their families, they left to try and find work in the west of France. The only job he found was in a tiny little village in Brittany. The locals found out that he used to be a priest. He found work as a philosophy teacher in a Catholic school, and things started to become hellish. We started to be intimidated. We got insults in the post. People sent packages filled with feces. We got death threats, and graffiti was sprayed on our walls. There was even an arson attack. The people who attacked us were the parents of the children at Dad's school. They were all churchgoers. They thought that a former priest who teaches philosophy was only going to pervert their children. Léa joined the Enfants du Silence Association, which gave her access to her father's archive. It's really horrible what they said to me. They said they purged the files of people like my dad. He spent 20 years in the priesthood, and apparently he only had five pages in his file. I mean, don't take me for an idiot. If there are only five pages, that means they trashed a lot of it. There are thought to be tens of thousands of children of priests around the world. The church never admitted their existence. But since 2017, the official line from Rome has changed. Any priest with a child now has to abandon the priesthood. I knew of someone in a different diocese, a priest whose partner was expecting a baby. And I said to him, you have to leave your ministry. You need to look after this woman and your child. The baby's well-being has to come before everything else. Since 2019, the French church has organized two unprecedented meetings with the children of priests. The aim has been to start a dialogue and address their situation. Sylviane, who's the president of the Enfants du Silence Association, has taken part in these meetings. After everything that's taken place and all the pedophilia scandals and stories of priests abusing children, a lot of work has been done by the media and a commission has been set up. From that point, we started working with them. So this is a letter addressed to the bishops and to the church superiors about the reception and the accompanying of the children of priests and nuns, encouraging them to grant access to the archives of dioceses and religious congregations. Each bishop is then free to respond or not according to his soul and his conscience. It's the first time in France that we've been listened to. It's also the first time that the Catholic Church in France has admitted the existence of these children. For years, priests were told to stay in their parishes and in their ministries and to abandon their women and their children. That's just disgraceful from a Catholic Church. Sylviane is herself the child of a priest. She found out when she was 44. And it was only when she inherited a desk from her mother this year that she stumbled across a stack of correspondence. This is a letter that I came across after my mother's death. It was sent to her from my father. I guess you could call it a love letter. My father used to address my mother in the most formal terms, and my name is also mentioned in it. And this is what he wrote. To see this little girl, a girl held by her dad, held by her mum, who only had eyes for her, 
I thought, you can imagine it for us, and I remembered the thought that you had. I want to have a little Sylviane with dark eyes. And yes, you will have your dark eyes and this little child's face. It will be our child if you so wish. It's a beautiful gift that's been sent down to me because both my parents are now gone. Un beau cadeau qui me vient de l'au-delà puisque euh, puisque maintenant mes deux parents sont sont partis. Her husband has always supported her. He still has faith, but admits that in light of the pedophilia scandals, he's been going a lot less to church. The dogma has this rigidity that is often needed to allow the church to govern. But it also has the disadvantage of being very long to change. We have seen how Pope Francis has managed best he can to change certain things, and he needs to be convinced that he can release the brakes and get rid of old habits. But I guess all big institutions have a problem when it comes to questioning themselves. Toutes les grandes institutions ont énormément de mal à se remettre en cause. Je suis chrétienne catholique. I am a Christian, and I'm still a church-going Catholic. I could have left the church 25 times in the past, but I decided to stay. It's only on the inside that you can change things. You can't do that by leaving, slamming the door and shouting. That's my own view anyway as a Christian. Celibacy was not inscribed in the Bible. Married men were able to become priests. But celibacy became obligatory in the 12th century to stop church property being handed down from father to son. But it was a rule that wasn't strictly followed, with at least eight popes hiding their illegitimate children. Anne Super is a theologist and the president of the Comité de la Jupe, which promotes feminism in the Catholic Church. In 2020, she became the first female candidate in the running for the Archbishopric of Lyon. She's adamant that we should get rid of celibacy for priests. The first reason, which everyone can see, is that priests suffer, and it's high time that we allowed relationships for those who want one. The second reason, and one that I'm not sure will be a great success, is that it would increase the number of people wanting to become a priest. And the third reason is that the Catholic Church is currently unable to comment on sexuality. But if it had married priests, it would have the right to do so. In 2021, there will be no movement on the stance taken by the Pope that ecclesiastical celibacy won't be discussed anymore. It's a position that we will not have any movement on in the years to come. That's because it's not just a disciplinary function, it's something mystical and religious. It has its roots in the celibacy of Christ. This is not just a human institution like a school, the UN, or whatever. It is above all the expression of God. So it can't see itself too much as being historically constructed. That's why the church's strategy is still about maintaining this eternalization of its choices. And so celibacy is something that could be removed. But tons of spiritual justifications are nevertheless put forward to make it seem like the idea came from God directly. The first major reform undertaken by the Church will trigger a whole range of other reforms. This domino effect is very frightening for an institution. To see that in one go, a section of its structure will move. But the second will also move, the third too, and the whole structure will need changing then. It's something which is really worrying, and it's a decision that one doesn't take lightly. And it's a decision that I think the Pope will not make. Since 2019, two French bishops have come out publicly to say that they're in favour of priests being able to get married. With Mass now over, Marc joins his family and friends for lunch at home. On the eve of his meeting with his bishop, he's made an important decision. He's going to leave the church. He wants a quiet exit to protect his parishioners, 
and he'll also be asking to officially return to being just a layperson. What has changed is being able to lead an ordinary family life. Usually, before a Sunday lunch, the priest leaves Mass and spends some time alone in his presbytery. But I'm just enjoying the most ordinary of Sundays with my family and friends. I think it's that that's changed the most for me. The couple's friends were surprised at first, then happy about their relationship but they still have some concerns. Some people can be malicious, so it's not easy. He'll have to make the necessary decisions because the church isn't going to change in five minutes or even six months. It's a situation that's still worrying because we know there will be obstacles ahead and we don't want that for our friends. The joy that we can see them share is what gives us confidence. We say, well, yes, it's a 2,000-year-old institution with its rules and so on. But it's nothing, really, faced with a love story. The next day, Marc's superiors took action. After hearing a podcast in which the couple discussed their situation, albeit using pseudonyms, his bishop decided to suspend him from his duties. The Catholic Institute, where he was teaching, also terminated his contract. A shocked Marc is now looking for work and considering legal action. In the meantime, he plans to get married, but in a civil ceremony. A report by Alexandra Renard, Georges Yazbek and Tom Waterhouse. You can, of course, see it again via our website, france24.com. This is Reporters Plus. I'm France 24. Stay with us. Most of all, stay safe. <laughs>